Hi, Sandia Vase readers. I'm glad you checked in with me here today because I have been missing you and I really do miss reading aloud um, and having such a great audience and hearing your feedback. And I know that some of our classes did start this book called The Terrible Two, written by Jory John and um, Mac Barnett and illustrated by Kevin Cornell. And I would like to continue reading it, especially with Miss Upton and Miss Hieronymus's classes, but um, you know, this is also a good time to tune into this book. Maybe you'll hear a sample and think, hey, that's a book I want to check out. And it is available um, online. And of course, when you come back to the library, it's something you might want to check out as well. Uh, the Terrible Two. Now, if you remember, it's about Miles Murphy, who's like known just for one thing. He is a prankster and he has to move to this new town, which is kind of boring, let's be honest. And all it is is cows and Yanni Valley, a very boring place. And he's wondering, what am I, what am I getting into? He has to start school and his mom is trying to encourage him. And the first day there is this prank that is amazing and he's super impressed. The principal's car is parked at the entrance steps to the school, which causes a big problem at the school and makes the principal very angry. And he's determined to find out who was responsible for this prank. And Miles is like, wow, that is incredible. I'm the prankster, though. Like, if I can't do all the pranking, then if I'm not the main prankster, then what role do I have at my new school? Mr. Barkin is definitely his own character. He's a little bit um, full of himself and gets very easily angry. He's determined to find out who pranked him. He, he gets into Miles's face the very first day. He's like, I know it was you. And he assigns him this buddy who really um, is kind of maybe a little bit needy, a little nerdy, a little uh, interesting, funny guy. So at his new school, Miles meets Niles, who is the buddy that Principal Barkin assigned to him. Um, he meets Holly, who seems pretty cool. She's just kind of in the background there, but nice to talk to. And then he meets Josh Barkin, the principal's son. And here's the first time they meet. The bell rang. A split second before the trilling stopped, the big kid, who looked like Principal Barkin, burst through the door. He took a look at the teacher's desk and, discovering it was still empty, strolled down Miles' aisle. As the big kid passed Miles, he let his backpack hit Miles in the face. Watch it, Nimbus, the big kid said to Miles. Your face just hit my new backpack. The kid took a seat in the last row. Who's he? Miles asked. Oh, that's Josh Barkin, the principal's son, said Holly. That's Josh Barkin, the principal's son, said Niles. Josh is pretty much the worst kid in the school, said Holly. While I don't want to call anyone the worst, Josh is pretty mean sometimes, said Niles. Also, he really likes the word nimbus for some reason. But that's not the last we hear of what Miles has to say about Josh, because at um, cafeteria time, he gets his way. Miles picked up his tray, turned around, and found himself face to face with Josh Barkin. My dad thinks you're the one who moved his car, Nimbus, Josh said. Okay, said Miles. That's going to be my car one day, said Josh. Okay, said Miles. So basically, you moved my car, you Nimbus. But I didn't, said Miles. And you embarrassed my dad and the Barkin family name, so basically you embarrassed my name. And that's why I'm going to beat you up, to preserve the honor of my name and to avenge my future car. So I will probably beat you up twice. Once for each. Well, I don't think your dad will like that, Miles said. Oh, I'm not going to beat you up at this school, said Josh. That would be against the rules, and I'm going to be principal here one day. But you know what, Miles Murphy? There's no school rule against beating you up on the sidewalk in front of your own house, or behind the gas station, or in the pasture. I will think of other places, too. Places where nobody will catch me. There are so many places where I can beat you up beside school, Miles Murphy, and nobody will ever know except for me and for you. Now, there's only one thing to do. Miles tilted his tray and spilled his lunch all over the front of his own clothes. Now he was covered in turkey, chili, tomato soup, and macaroni and cheese. What the, said Josh. Why did you do that? Miles cried out. Why did you do that to me? 
The kids in the cafeteria heard the commotion and turned to see Miles covered in food. They pointed. They laughed. <laughs> the room went wild. What is going on here? Mrs. Shandy walked up to Miles and Josh. She stared at the stain on Miles' shirt. Josh came up and just knocked my lunch tray out of my hand, said Miles. I didn't, said Josh. That Nimbus spilled it all over himself. Why would I spill food on myself, said Miles. I don't know, said Josh, because you're a maniac. Miss Shandy, I never break the rules. You know that. Mrs. Shandy looked from Miles to Josh. I think I can help. Miss Shandy, I saw everything. It was Niles. Uh, yeah, Niles, said Josh. What happened here? Niles, said Miles. Josh walked right up to Miles and knocked the tray out of his hands, said Niles. It was just like Miles said. Josh was shocked. Miles was shocked. Mrs. Shandy smiled. She had been waiting for this day for a long time. Lots of teachers had. Come on, Mr. Barkin. We're going to go see the principal. And she led Josh out toward the principal's office. Everyone in the lunchroom watched them leave. Why'd you do that, Miles asked. Josh made me swallow a rock over the summer. Twice. Well, thanks. Here's your milks, said Niles, picking up the cartons off the floor. They didn't break. So as we know, Miles has gone to a new school and a new place which he thinks is incredibly boring. He is confronted with a mysterious prankster who he is determined to outdo. He has two friends, Holly and, well, Mile, uh, sorry, Niles is becoming his friend, even though he has to be friends with Niles because Principal Barkin assigned him, it's the buddy system, I guess, which Miles is getting used to his new school, or somewhat, although he's still struggling to find his place. And he decides that he has to outdo this prankster, whoever he is. Miles had to do something, something big, something huge. And he decides to throw the party of a lifetime, although um, no one's quite sure who's throwing it. He just knows that if he builds up enough hype around it, that everyone will want to come. And that will be the best joke of all. Cody Burr Tyler's 13th birthday party this Saturday at noon on the Yawnee Valley Green. We rented out the gazebo. Bring presents. Important. The invitation is not a ticket to the party. Your ticket is as good as a birthday present. Also, I'm only inviting cool kids, so don't tell everybody. Shh. This is going to be secret. Be there or be lame. And also don't forget the present. Make it good. Hmm. So that invitation went out to everybody else, and everyone at the school is as buzzed. Did anybody else get an invitation from Cody Burr Tyler? And then all these girls are like, shh, nobody's supposed to know. And he is so excited to see everybody's face when he goes to the party and discovers that he who pranked everyone, and it was, it's a huge success, everybody is there, including Niles, and Miles is about to get up to the stage and announce, um, I just, and then everyone starts ch chanting, Cody, Cody, although nobody knows who he is because he doesn't exist, Cody, and then Principal Barkin starts clapping his hands, Cody, and all eyes were directed at an empty stage, Miles smoothed the front of his shirt, ready to make an entrance and give his speech. He's going to say to everybody, Hello, everybody. My name is Miles Murphy, and I am the new kid here in Yawnee Valley. I'd love to take this opportunity to say happy birthday to Cody Burr Tyler. I'd love to, but I can't, because Cody Burr Tyler doesn't exist. I made him up. Yes, I'm sorry to say that it isn't a party celebrating Cody Burr Tyler's 13th birthday, but it is a happy occasion, the greatest prank that Yawnee Valley has ever seen. And then all of a sudden, the gazebo steps. This was his moment. This was perfect. It was going to be the best. He walked back toward the gazebo. The kids chanted, the sun shone. And then an electric guitar riff blasted through the park. The crowd parted. From its midst rose a tall boy wearing a football helmet and jersey. He bounded past Miles and took the gazebo five steps in a single leap. The boy had an electric guitar around his shoulder. The number on his back of his jersey was one, and the name was Cody Burr Tyler. Ha! Ah, he's here! Wait, Cody Burr Tyler doesn't exist. How can this be happening, Miles thinks. Now, we'll continue our story. What just happened? 
for chapter 16. Miles was now sitting on the bottom step of the gazebo. Seriously, what just happened? Miles sat and wondered. Kids laughed, music played, and Miles just sat. Parents waved to kids and kids got into cars. The cars drove away, leaving behind clouds of dust. Miles sat. The stragglers took the last of the food, hot dogs and brownies, but not cake. Because remember, Miles made the cake and it was kind of dry. When they left, Miles could not remember what they'd said. It was all just noise. Everybody else left the park, but Miles still sat. Somewhere in the distance, a cow mooed. Miles sat. The sun set and the park lights blazed. The sprinklers came on and Miles just sat. About an hour after dusk, Miles decided that that was enough. And he stood up. Miles felt like he had entered a new world. Now that a fake kid had become real, anything was possible. Maybe the gazebo would launch into space and Miles would colonize the horse head nebula. Maybe lightning would strike that oak over there, crack it open, and gold coins would pull forth. Maybe a volcano would rise up from the field and lava would devour Yanni Valley. But the eruption's blast would also propel Miles safely back to his old apartment in a pink building that was close to the ocean with maps on the walls and on the ceiling, back to his old town where he was a master prankster and everyone knew it. Miles waited for a few seconds for something to happen. Nothing happened. All that was left of Cody Burr Tyler's party was a field full of trash and a platter full of cake. Miles grabbed a garbage bag. He ate a fingerful of frosting and then dumped the cake into the bag. He picked up paper plates and candy wrappers, soda bottles and cans, pizza crusts and stray potato chips. Miles was supposed to leave the park with the wagon's worth of presents, but all he had was a big bag of trash. He didn't even have the wagon anymore. He'd had that wagon since he was six. Despite what everybody said, Miles was starting to think Cody Burt Tyler wasn't that cool at all. Take away the football helmet and the electric guitar and all you have is a wagon thief. The trash bag slung over his shoulder. Miles took one last look at the park. Underneath the picnic table was something he'd somehow missed. It was a present. Miles dropped the trash bag and ran for the table. He got on all fours, the grass wet, soaked his knees. Miles crawled under the table and picked up the gift. He looked around for Cody Burr Tyler, who might at any moment pull up in his limo and claim this last present. But no, Miles was alone. There, under the table, he held the present in his lap. It was the size of a shoebox, and its silver paper shimmered in the moonlight. Miles bit through the ribbon and ripped off the wrapping. It was a shoebox. The lid was taped on. Miles worked his index finger under the tape and he popped off the lid. Tissue paper. He peeled back the tissue paper and peered inside. There, in the box, lying as lifeless as a real dead chicken, was a rubber chicken. This was apparently somebody's idea of a joke. He grabbed the chicken by the legs, walked back to his trash bag and tossed it in. The chicken landed belly up on the top of some hot wings and there was a message written on the chicken's belly. Miles reached into the bag and pulled out the chicken. The words were written in big block letters. You can't trick a trickster. Meet me in Sherman's pasture, Sunday, sunset. Come alone. Who would give this to Cody Burr Tyler? Miles dropped the chicken and ran back to the table. He rummaged through the wrapping and pulled out a tiny gold gift tag. The words were written in delicate cursive. Two miles from Niles. Fact 313. Cows have 32 teeth, just like you and me. Fact 314. Cows came to America with the pilgrims, but they didn't wear those funny hats. Fact 315. Cows can't vomit. Maybe it's something having to do with how many stomachs they have. Here we are, next chapter, chapter 17, Sunday Sunset. Miles clutched the chicken in his right hand, his grip firm. He transferred it to his left hand. Both palms were sweaty, so was the chicken. Behind Miles was the sound of a breaking stick. Miles whipped around. It was Niles, except Niles didn't look like Niles. It was hard to say what was different about him. He wasn't wearing a sash, but it was more than that. 
It was more than his must hair, more than his steely expression, more than his tan jacket and navy blue turtleneck. Well, maybe it had something to do with the turtleneck. It was that Niles looked cool in the turtleneck, and Miles had never seen anybody look cool in a turtleneck, and Miles had never seen Niles look cool at all. But he did tonight. He looked taller. He looked in control. Why did you bring the chicken? asked Niles. Miles looked down at the chicken and then back up at Niles. Um, I thought we might need it. For what? Like maybe this meeting had something to do with the chicken, said Miles. The chicken was just a way to deliver a message. A prankster often communicates with another prankster by writing a message on a rubber chicken. Oh, said Miles. Okay, so do you want the chicken back, or should I just keep him, or drop him somewhere, or... Forget about the chicken, Miles said. Somewhere in the distance, a cow mooed. This meeting was getting away from Miles. You ruined my birthday party prank, he shouted at Niles. I saved your birthday party prank. Saved it? Saved it? <laughs> Miles tried to laugh, but his mouth was dry and he could not only cough. That's insane. You stole all my presents, or Cody Burr Tyler stole, stole my presents, or whoever that was. Who was that? Oh, just some kid from Hillsdale. I paid 20 bucks to impersonate Cody Burr Tyler. And he has my presence? Nope, I have your presence, Miles. And you call that saving my prank? Your prank wasn't even a prank. What? Let me ask you, Miles. How did you expect your prank to play out? I was going to get up there, tell everybody I'd prank them, and get a bunch of presents. So you were just going to walk away with all those presents after you told the entire school that you'd lied to them? Miles thought for a moment. Yes. And how was that going to work exactly? I guess I thought they'd be so stunned by the prank that they'd just watch me go. Miles stared at Miles. All right, I see your point, Miles said. It still would have made my name. I would have pranked the entire school in one go. Everybody would have known Miles Murphy. Yeah, Miles Murphy, the thief and liar. Well, when you put it that way. If you prank everyone, who is left to appreciate the prank? Pranking everybody is like pranking nobody. Huh? said Miles. You're forgetting one of the basic rules of pranking, Miles said. The goat has to deserve it. A goat? Miles rolled his eyes. Do your research, Miles. A goat is what pranksters call their victims. And to be a goat, someone has to have it coming. Everyone loves to see a goat get pranked. That's why Principal Barkin is such a great goat. He always has it coming. Plus, he turns purple. So were you the one who put Barkin's car at the top of the steps? Niles stared at Miles again. Who are you to lecture me about pranking? Miles asked. I was the best prankster at my old school. I was a legend. You were a yak. What? Niles sighed. A yak. A yak is someone who's always bragging about his pranks. A prankster doesn't prank for fame. A prankster pranks for the prank. Miles tightened his grip around the rubber chicken's neck. Listen, said Niles, when people know you're a prankster, they're all watching you. Kids are waiting to see what you do next. Principals are tailing you down the halls. To a real prankster, that's death. The best pranks require a lot of work require preparation. To truly pull off a great prank, you need to be invisible. The best pranks leave everyone wondering. Niles had a point. If Niles was being honest, his classic Operation Sandy shorts would have been a much better prank if his homeroom teacher hadn't caught him immediately. And the stuff about goats made sense, too. By the time Mel Miles left his old town, Carl and Ben, his closest friends and near-constant pranking victims, weren't really taking his calls anymore. But, but, but it's so fun taking credit for your pranks, Miles said. Niles smiled. I agree. That's why I sent you the chicken. That's why you're here today. I have a proposal. Miles waited. I'm proposing, said Niles, that we team up. We become a pranking duo, co-conspirators, a secret society founded on mutual admiration and the joy. Of pranking. I even have a name picked out. We'll call ourselves the Terrible Two.
So until next time, Sandia Base readers, I hope you'll tune in with me again as we continue to read The Terrible Two. Um, I'd also like to hear from you what kinds of books you would like me to read to you.